uh, it's good on several levels to, to meet together, and obviously uh, a big part of it is just coming together as an assembly or as a church so that we can encourage each other and challenge each other and enjoy some time worshiping together. So today um, we're going to continue this morning in, in our series that we've been going through on Sunday mornings during our morning teaching hour, or whatever you want to call this time. Um, it's not really Sunday school necessarily, but uh, we kind of do our own thing in that sense. So um, we've been studying through some of the great journeys of faith in the Bible, and we started very early in the Bible. We looked at Abraham and his life, and we've talked about Moses a little bit, and we're going to be back to Moses today. Um, we've defined what faith is. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of obscurity in people's minds about what faith is, and you hear people talk about it and say little trendy phrases uh, in their churches or, or amongst other Christians. Um, what is faith? Talk to me. What is faith? How do we define it from a biblical perspective? Okay, so trust um, or confidence or assurance in the Word of God. That's it. So God says something. I choose to believe it. I choose to put my confidence in that and to then um, simply obey, right? And so faith in that sense is very easily defined, and you can see that many of the, the great giants of faith that we see in the Bible, well, they really weren't giants at all. I mean, they were great people, and, and we probably won't quite aspire to uh, ever aspire to be at, at their level of walk with God, uh, although we should try. Um, but they just simply obeyed the Lord. I mean, they, they listened to God's <coughs> word, they followed the promises or the commands of God, and they, uh, and they obeyed. And so, as you walk through Hebrews chapter 11, the great heroes of faith chapter, well, you see one, one person after another, after another, after another. It says, by faith, that God told them to do this, and they did it. And, I mean, it's almost kind of anticlimactic to see the way that it's related, but over and over. That's, what, that's not maybe what man values as being extremely important, but that's what God values. And so the Bible tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please him. You want to know how to please God this morning? You need to get your heart and your mind wrapped around the Word of God, and you just simply need to obey it, okay? And so some of the, the great journeys of faith we're, we're walking through, and today I want to paint you a picture from the book of Exodus. It's going to give you a clear contrast between somebody who did walk by faith and some who did not, all right? Um, we're going to follow the, the journey of the nation of Israel as they go to Mount Sinai, all right? Now, we talked here a couple of weeks ago about Moses being born in Egypt. There was the command from Pharaoh, execute all the male babies. We don't want the population growing anymore because we're worried about them overthrowing us or some kind of a massive rebellion on the part of the Israelites against the, the Egyptians. And so, well, we know that the, those who were in charge of the births and so forth, they didn't follow that command. They feared God. And so they did what they could to work around that command. And, and then Moses is born, born to um, a God-fearing family. Do you guys remember his mother's name? Anybody? Chocobed, right? You guys remember talking about her? It was only two weeks ago. <laughs> Nobody remembers. Okay. Anyway, um, well, Dr. Ben was the mother's name. We don't know what his father's name was, but we do know that it says that by faith, those parents hid Moses. Um, they, they just simply obeyed God's word and respected the sanctity of life and made sure that they didn't follow the king's command, which was against the word of God. And so they, uh, they stepped out by faith and they obeyed God's word and did what they were supposed to. Well, those parents invested a lot in Moses and we kind of followed it up to the point where Moses was in the palace being raised by Pharaoh's daughter, basically being raised as royalty, uh, afforded all of the opportunities uh, of Egypt when it came to education and when it came to the culture and pleasures and anything else that he wanted to invest himself in. And we saw that eventually he came to a point when he came to years, when he came to maturity, he rejected all of that and said, no, I want to follow God. And I'm going to follow God's people and I'm going to follow God's will for my life and give up the things of the world. All right. And so there came a time when it went transition from his parents training in God's word to his own personal convictions and what he was going to apply. That's faith. All right. And so now we're going to pick that journey up here in just a minute. 
Um, how many people here have heard of Corey Ten Boom? How many people? A few of you. Um, Corey Ten Boom came from a, a large family in Holland back during <coughs> the uh, World War II occupation, um, the German occupation or Nazi occupation of that country. Uh, the, of course, the order had gone out to round up as many Jews as possible. They were sending them to concentration camps and executing them during the Holocaust. And um, many of the, uh, well, there were a number of different people who formed a kind of an underground resistance. The Ten Boom family was a part of that. Corey was just a little girl at that time. And, uh, and so they used their house to shelter many Jewish people or Jewish families and try to get them out of that area to safety before the Nazis could round them up. And so um, many people that were uh, staying there in about the year 1944 were hidden illegally, of course, while they were waiting for another safe house to be located. And through the, the, ten, the ten, 10 Boom families activities uh, as part of that underground, they were able to save about 800 Jews, just, just that family itself. On uh, February 28th, 1944, the family was betrayed <coughs> and given up to the Nazi secret police. Their home was raided, and the entire family was rounded up and arrested. Uh, Corey, as well as the rest of the family, some of the family was killed. Others were sent to the death camps. Um, Corey and, and her sister, being younger children, they were sent to a concentration camp as well. She writes in her memoirs about how unbearable or nearly unbearable that life was. But um, those sisters spent their time witnessing for God during their time there. They shared the faith that was very evident in their lives with many people, giving hope in those very dark, desperate times. And, you know, at times, it must have no doubt seemed like um, God wasn't hearing their prayers while they were there in prison. Uh, there was a quotation that was found on the wall of one of the prison rooms where one of those two sisters was staying. It said this, um, I believe in the sun, even when it's not shining. Uh, I believe in God, even when he is silent. Well, ultimately, out of the, the family of ten, um, four of the ten booms gave their lives for their commitment to hiding the Jews and trying to obey God's commands in, uh, in sheltering them. Um, and Corey realized that her life was a gift from God. She survived that ordeal, and she spent much of her life in the latter years of her life sharing her testimony of what she had learned with other people all over the world and the life of Corey Ten Boom, and of course the rest of her family, but her specifically provides a wonderful example, a tremendous example of waiting on God. Uh, she trusted him. She waited patiently to see how he would work on her behalf and direct her on her journey as she sought to serve the Lord. Now, unlike that godly lady, many people throughout history have failed when it comes to the reaction that they have when they're put into difficult or dark situations, when there's trials that come, when there's temptations that come. Many people fall flat on their faces. They don't have the, the spiritual strength. They don't have the resiliency. They don't have the spiritual roots that are put down in their life to anchor them during those difficult times and during those storms. In our text today, we're going to see that the Israelite nation came to a point where they also refused to wait on God um, during the journey that he was taking them on, which was supposed to be a very uh, a very unique and special journey to the promised land, the land of Canaan. <coughs> In Exodus, we can see a number of things develop. We can see the mighty hand of God, undisputedly God himself bringing his people out of Egypt. Out of bondage, out of hopelessness, the Israelites were let go by the Egyptians, and they were free for the first time in 400 years. God opened the Red Sea when it was seemingly impossible and guided them through on dry ground while at the same time drowning the pursuing Egyptian army and Pharaoh. While they 
were on their short journey into the wilderness, God provided the daily food of manna, bread from heaven, a miraculous happening to feed that entire nation. A few weeks into this historic journey, God called Moses to a special meeting at Mount Sinai. He had already told Moses, in fact, I believe we read it a couple of weeks ago, when Moses had first met with God on the mountain, remember he, God spoke to him through the burning bush and called him and gave him his marching orders. God told him, here's the sign or here's the token that I'm going to deliver you. When I deliver you from Egypt, you will come and worship me on this mountain. And so that's the destination that they're headed to. And while uh, on this particular journey, Moses received the Ten Commandments, which would be the cornerstone of the law as he went up onto the mountain and met with God. And so what we can see, I'm just kind of giving you a real quick overview before we jump into this. God demonstrated his care and his protection and his grace and his love and mercy for the Israelite nation time after time after time. He was intentionally taking them on a long journey to strengthen their faith. And one of the unique and interesting things that you ought to know is that the Bible says that God didn't lead them through the most direct route straight up to the land of Canaan, which would have been very quick and very easy to arrive at. He led them a different direction so that they would be tested just a little bit. They would be tried to see how strong their faith was and how strong their dependence on him would be before he was just going to lavish on them all the blessings that he had promised. And so, in route, um, God proved himself strong repeatedly on their behalf. And so, consider the journey here a little bit. First of all, a glorious journey. This, For Moses, anyway, it was a glorious journey. In Exodus chapter 31, just turn there, we'll flip to a couple of different passages as we go. Um, Exodus chapter 31 and verse 18. This is while, uh, or after arrival and while on Mount Sinai, it says that he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. How many people here would like to have like a personal message from God like that? Pretty amazing, huh? God himself inscribed these stones um, with his uh, with his commandments. We know that the Ten Commandments were etched on that. Well, Moses received that, right? Moses was God's chosen leader for the nation of Israel. His life had been directed by God from birth. We already know that his parents had invested in him a tremendous amount of of heart and training and resources and character development to bring him to where he could be useful for God and brought him to a point where he could make those choices himself and then take on his own convictions based on what he'd been taught and serve the Lord. He was a tremendous example of a man who was a friend of God. All right, I want you to really consider the personal and intimate communication between Moses and God that we can see in his life. In Deuteronomy chapter 34 and verse 10, it says this, that there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. What a tremendous and close association they had with each other. Through his faithfulness and through his dedication to follow God, Moses had merited the privilege to speak to God just like I'm speaking to you right now. What an amazing opportunity he was given. Exodus 33, 11 says this, The Lord spoke unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. You know, God desires our <coughs> communication with him and our communion with him to be as friend to friend. And, and I'll just say this for, uh, for a moment. There's many people that in their <clears throat> their prayer, um, their prayer life, their uh, seeming communication with God or anything else, there's just kind of a, uh, a, a an uncomfortable, rigid formality that they go through. It's just, um, Jesus calls it vain repetitions a lot of the time. And there's not a closeness that's evidenced in people's lives many times with the Lord. Well, we can see that it was different with Moses. God certainly desires for it to be different with us, too, where there is 
a comfort level because of continual communion with him where we can speak to God in this way. Moses was a man who was favored in the eyes of the Lord. Exodus 33 and verse 17 says, And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Moses continually sought to obey and to honor God with his life. That was his focus. And God led Moses and Israel to this point in their journey on Mount Sinai, and he was preparing to hand them the greatest law book in history. It continues to be the greatest law book in history. Many of our nation's laws are founded on that as well, or at least were at one time. Well, we see the meeting between God and Moses here, and, and I'm, I'm not reading you a large portion of scripture this morning, but I'm just trying to give you the overall picture that we're driving at. In Exodus chapter 31 and verse 18, we see the, the unique reunion of God and Moses on that mountain. Remember, as I mentioned a moment ago, this special relationship began when Moses came to the burning bush and communed with God for the first time there. God called him to that important work in his life that he was going to spend the rest of his days doing. Back in Exodus chapter 3 and verse 4, it says, When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. And now as we fast forward into Exodus 31, we learn that Moses had been communing with the Lord for 40 days without food, um, or presumably water or other nutrition. He was so occupied with the Lord that even the very basics of life were ignored on his part. He was fasting. He was spending time with the Lord. I don't know um, how God sustained him, but it was something that was supernatural, I believe. I, I don't know how you can live for 40 days without water. I think it's physically impossible for any of us to probably do that. But Moses is up on the top of this mountain and just completely enamored with God and spending time with him for that period of time. You guys know that he was up on the top of Mount Sinai for that entire time, right? 40 days straight. In, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 9, Moses recounts this and talks about this experience where he was face to face with the Lord up there. In Deuteronomy 9, 9, it says, When I was gone up into the mount to receive the tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant which the Lord made with you, then I abode in the mount forty days and forty nights. I did neither eat bread nor drink water. That was Moses' own testimony. And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God. And on them was written according to all the words which the Lord spoke with you in the mount out of the midst of the fire in the day of that assembly. And it came to pass at the end of forty days and forty nights that the Lord gave me the two tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant. That's the Old Testament or the Old Covenant that was given. And so we have this uh, incredible reunion between God and Moses there as they spend this time together. And then obviously the revelation that God shares with Moses, the information that God gave him was so important, so critically important, that he wrote it with his own hand and gave it directly to Moses to give to the people. And he gave it to them set in stone. In other words, I think that's really a picture of the permanence of God's covenant with them and also the permanence of God's law never goes away. <clears throat> it's never irrelevant. You know, um, revelation is truth that's given from God to man that was not previous, previously known or, or could not even be known unless God gave it. All right. God spoke to the children of Israel through Moses. Moses was his spokesman, his mouthpiece. It was very critical, obviously, for this important leader to be very close to God. But God was revealing his truth through Moses to the Israelite people um, when God delivered his people from bondage in Egypt. He revealed himself through those mighty acts towards them. Today, we don't have God speaking to us in that way, do we? Uh, has anybody here ever had God speak to them in the way that we're talking about? Please don't raise your hand if you <laughs> Well, some people claim that they have supernatural experiences, and I have no doubt that some people do have supernatural experiences. 
um, spiritual experiences, but I seriously doubt the spirit that they're communing with in that case, because the Bible is very plain that God does not reveal himself in this way. His revelation is complete. He's spoken to us through his word, hasn't he? His word is what he's given us, that we are to put our faith in, we're to put our trust in, and, um, and that is the only book that he's given to us himself. It's inspired, it is true, it is inerrant, it's his revelation to us, and listen, it's not just his revelation to you and I, so that we have some bank of intellectual knowledge now, all right? It is given to us so that we have real experience with him, just like Moses was able to enjoy that close intimacy and that close walk with God, that's what God desires for all of his people. It's really up to you and I whether we're going to appreciate that and take advantage of it. Okay, and so we see the right reaction here in the case of Moses where he recognized the importance of communion with God, and he recognized the importance of receiving God's revelation as it was in truth. It was directly from God himself. The Bible tells us in Psalm 119 and verse 160, thy word is true from the beginning. Every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Well, the Bible goes on and, and makes it very plain as this same thought is developed later in the scriptures. Um, God, who at, at sundry times and in divers manner spoke to our fathers by the prophets, like Moses, has in these last days spoken unto us. And he's spoken unto us by giving us his son and giving us his word. And that's the truth that God's invested in you and I so that we have the opportunity to put our faith and confidence in that. Well, we have a clear contrast now. So we have Moses. The picture of him is God sustained him along and he's spent this 40 days on Mount Sinai receiving the law and communing with God face to face as God's friend. Now we have a picture of everybody else in the nation. Well, everybody else except one person. There was one other guy that was up there on Mount Sinai. Do you guys know who it was? Anybody know who it was? Joshua. Yeah, Joshua, right? Calls him Moses' minister. He's the young man that's there helping. Later, he's going to become Moses' replacement in leading the nation of Israel into Canaan. So we'll, we'll cut him out of the mix. And, and uh, well, I can imagine that there was probably a handful of other righteous people that didn't go along with this, but they're not identified by name. But we have this, uh, this crossroads now at Mount Sinai that the nation comes to. Exodus chapter 32 and verse 1. Listen to it. It says, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mountain. All right, now Moses is up there. We have this glorious picture. In fact, if you read in Hebrews chapter 12, it gives you a picture. Of, it gives you a, a scene that's set there. You guys know that it wasn't just, well, we can't see Moses anymore, and we don't know if God's real or anything, so we're just going to do our own thing. No, the Bible describes that scene there. God descending from heaven on the mountaintop. And um, the terms in which it's described are almost terrifying. In fact, it's a picture of terror as God comes down and gives his law. And the Bible says that there's thunderings and they could hear the voice of God speaking from the mountaintop this entire time. So there's no, uh, there's no thought here that, well, maybe this is just some fantasy that's going on in Moses' mind. They were watching and seeing God give his law to Moses on the top of this mountain. No doubt at all. And it says, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, Exodus 32, 1, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not, we know not what has become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and of your sons and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it into a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast of the Lord. I don't even understand the strange hypocrisy that's going on there. And they rose up early on the morrow, and they offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink, and they rose up to play. 
that we'll talk about what that is. But we can see the impatience of the people here, right? As, as they're brought to a, a decision point, whether they're going to follow God or not, they have to decide for themselves. Now, the children of Israel, they have witnessed many miracles up to this point. In the, in the days immediately preceding this, they had also spoken their allegiance to God and pledged that they would do whatever he said. While they were camping in the wilderness near Mount Sinai now, God called Moses into the mountain for this special meeting that we talked about, and they were to wait while he went up to speak with Moses. All right, well, he went up to speak with God, I'm sorry. Moses stayed up on the mountain for those 40 days, and instead of waiting, instead of trusting, instead of doing what they had been told by God, they began reasoning in their hearts as to what happened to Moses. They're rationalizing and figuring out a way that they can work around God's command. Maybe they're second-guessing now that they have their liberty from Egypt about where they really want to go. They took their focus off of God, and they turned it on themselves, bottom line. The children of Israel got weary of waiting for Moses to return. And they began to doubt. And they began to be impatient. And looking at the circumstances around them rather than trusting and waiting on God will always cause us to grow doubtful and impatient as well. That's why God gives us something concrete like the truth of his word to put our confidence in. We don't have to worry about the circumstances that we face. Waiting for God, by the way, as these people were called to do, is never a bad thing. It's not laziness. It's not um, going to sleep and just sitting around and doing nothing. Um, when we talk about waiting on God, it, it means doing the activity that God's already commanded you to do, for one thing. Staying engaged and busy. And it's being ready for any further commands that God gives. All right, We're, we're trusting the Lord. We're following Him. Maybe he's not revealed the next step of the way to us, but we're going to wait on him and do what we already know we ought to be doing. Not only did the Israelites doubt here, they demanded their own way. And so the Bible records for us that they said, Aaron, up, make us gods. Uh, they decided not to wait until Moses came down and get further guidance from the Lord, but to take things into their own hands. And they demanded that Aaron make them a god that they could worship and they're Impatience led to idolatry. And so here's the problem, all right? So we have, we, we can see this consistent, um, steady development of circumstances that happen in their lives. We can see it in our lives as well. When we're not being patient, keeping our hearts and our eyes focused on the truth of God and following God's commands in faith, then it leads us to seek fulfillment elsewhere. And that's what happened there, all right? They sought idolatry. And then, idolatry led to immorality. And that's always the sequence of events in, uh, in our lives. We can, we can probably see it reflected in our own past at some point. We can certainly see it reflected in the lives of others who don't follow the Lord. And so, we have the idolatry of the people here. Um, obviously, I don't have to go into this very deeply, folks. I, at least, I hope that I don't. God has said, no idols. Don't worship anything else. Don't serve anything else. And when we talk about idolatry, we're not just talking about a little stick figure that you might put on a, on a mantle and worship or, or something like that. We're talking about anything that takes precedence over God, anything that takes priority over God. That's an idol, whether it's a, a tangible idol or whether it's an intangible idol, it's no difference. And God tells us very clearly that this, he says in 2 Corinthians 6.16, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. This is people who are believers. As God has said, I will dwell in them and will walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And so no association with idols when it comes to being God's people. Well, um, we need to be people who are completely free of idolatry. And the only way that that happens is if we have the character and the, and the convictions in us that we say, this is what God's word says and I'm going to root my confidence and my faith in that. I'm not going to be distracted, and I'm not going to be impatient. I'm going to follow the Lord and what he showed me to do right now. As I said, the next natural step in the degenerative process that always happens with mankind is going from idolatry as you get your heart off the Lord to immorality. And so the Bible tells us that the people, well, they to appease their religious conscience, 
they went ahead and built this altar and dedicated a day to the Lord before they did their willful sin. Uh, I don't even have anything to say about that, all right? Uh, it's it's the, the greatest and clearest of hypocrisy that you can possibly see. Some way of justifying what they were going to go into doing. And then they start to worship this idol, and it says that they, they got done with their little sanctifying day for the Lord, and then they rose up to eat and to drink and to play, all right? Now, the complete indulgence of the flesh, um, whether this is the drinking of alcohol, I don't know. I would assume that it probably is because usually idolatrous activity and alcohol and immorality, sexual immorality, are all going to be tied in together. Almost always you're going to see that, and almost always when people's hearts are off the Lord and following other things, there's going to be sexual immorality too, because those strong passions that are built into human nature, when they're allowed to just run rampant and do whatever is natural unchecked, well, that's what's going to come to the surface. And so we can see that that's what happens. Well, so so that's what the people decided. Pretty clear contrast, right? So here you have Moses who says, God's spoken to me. He told me to come here and to receive his law and to receive his covenant. Moses is communing with God face to face. He, he is really uh, tremendously fulfilled in every possible way in doing that. And then you have this decision point where the Israelite nation decides to go the opposite way. Right at the base of Mount Sinai, as Moses is there receiving the law of God, they're there breaking every single command that God was giving and flaunting it in God's face, um, completely careless about the judgment that may come. You know, the Israelite people had this continual problem uh, throughout history. They continue to all the way into the New Testament where they always wanted to just see the tangible. They wanted to see miracles. They wanted to see God, some sign of God's uh, manifestation physically. They never have the confidence or the faith to just say, this is what God said, and we're going to go ahead and act on that. Now, talking as a whole, um, there were obviously exceptions to that in some cases. The Bible tells us this. We walk by faith, not by sight. All right? And so, unfortunately, many people come to the Lord or they come to some kind of difficulty in their life, some kind of trial, some kind of uh, um, problem like the Israelites were going through here in the different tests and trials that they were experiencing. And, and that's when they get spiritual, you know, and they're going to start uh, trying to do something to serve God and try to turn things around. And, and, and they operate in much the same way that the Israelites did in that they want some, some outward manifestation of God, or they want to see God change circumstances physically in their lives, and that's really all that they care about and all they're motivated by. That's not sincerity, folks. It's not sincerity at all. In Moses' case, um, there was a difference there. Moses cared about a relationship with God, having his heart right with God, and walking with God in close communion. The rest of the people were completely focused on the outward. Having their flesh fulfilled or taking care of some kind of difficulty, that's when they would turn to God, is whenever they had some catastrophe going on. Clear contrast, right? Clear difference between sincerity in faith in the Lord and insincerity that was just rooted in, what can I get out of this spiritual experience? Don't be the latter type. Don't be them. Okay? So, then we have God's judgment here as I wind this down. I'm going to talk about it in Exodus chapter 32. God speaks about this situation that's developed. Moses is coming down off of the mountain. Him and Joshua are listening, and they hear this incredibly raucous, out-of-control noise coming from the camp. And Joshua, always a warrior, of course, um, his immediate thought is there, there's a sound of war in the camp. We're being attacked. And Moses said, I hear a lot of noise too, but it's not the sound of war that I hear. It's the sound of partying that I hear. And as they come down and they come into sight, that's what they see. This massive nationwide um, uh, orgy or something that's going on here. I mean, it, literally, if you look at what the Bible talks about in Corinthians as well with this happening, that's what was going on. Just phenomenal immorality, the grossest immorality that you can imagine. And it's taking place nationwide. And so Moses comes down and God um, basically says... 
I'm already done with these people. I want to wash my hands of them. I'm going to wipe the entire nation off the face of the earth. And I'll just go ahead and start over with you, Moses. And Moses intercedes for the nation. And, um, and we fast forward a little bit. Exodus 32 and verse 30. It says, it came to pass on the morrow. It's the next day. That Moses said unto the people, you have sinned a great sin. And now I will go up unto the Lord. Peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin. They've made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin. And there's just kind of a, a break in the text there. Um, it's just kind of a, um, I don't know. I, well, he doesn't finish his thought, right? If you'll forgive their sin, then the presumption is, okay, their sins are forgiven. And then we can move on. And if not, if you won't forgive them, then blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Tells you a little something about the character and the motive of Moses, doesn't it? And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. And that shows something about God's character too, doesn't it? Justice is something that's going to be served. There are no proxies when it comes to receiving God's judgment. I can't suffer for your sins, and you can't suffer for mine. We will all individually stand before God and answer to him in his justice and in his righteousness. And so we have Moses' prayer. Pours out his heart before the Lord. Offers, God, if there's any way possible for you to forgive the, the gross idolatry and immorality and wrong character and wrong motives of the Israelite nation, um, take your judgment out on me. In fact, uh, this book that he's talking about, if you read throughout the rest of the Bible, you can see several times in the New Testament, it talks about the book of life. It's a book in which the names of all the saved are written. And God keeps a diligent record of that so that when judgment day comes, the Bible says, whoever's name is not found written in the book of life will be cast into the lake of fire. And so Moses says, God, if, if, if there's no other way possible, if I can be a substitute and sacrifice myself so that you don't bring your judgment on these people, they rightly deserve to die. But if I can do this, I'll give up my eternal soul if necessary. Just send me to hell in their place. And God's answer is very plain. He says, no, that's not going to happen, Moses. Um, I mean, it's commendable for, for making such a suggestion, I'm sure, but it's not going to happen. They'll answer for their own sin. They're going to pay for their own sins here. And uh, and so, again, we can see the, the personal responsibility that comes. And unfortunately, before it was over with, God said this entire nation, Moses included, is not going to enter into the promised land and enjoy the, the promises that I've given them. Well, Moses, uh, we come back to our point here as I conclude. Moses was enjoying a glorious encounter with God himself. The closest communion that you can possibly imagine, talking face to face like a, a person talks to their friend, the Bible says. And the children of Israel are at this, um, this terrible crossroads, impatiently choosing to worship God their own way, seeking um, nothing but physical satisfaction and as a result of their disobedience because they weren't willing to just see what God's word says, what they already knew, and follow what God said, um, then they incurred nothing but the judgment of God on their lives. Well, folks, as we, as we proceed through our week, may we remember the goodness of God in offering salvation, and may we share this good news with others, and may we as God's people have the focus and the character of heart to intercede like Moses did on the behalf of others, and make sure that we're living to take the message of God's mercy and his salvation through the one who can be the substitute, which is Jesus Christ, um, to all those people that need it so desperately. So where are you at? The question on your journey of faith, we're just kind of repeating the same theme over and over every week, aren't we? And we can see it reflected. In fact, this is the overall theme of the Bible, is whether people walk in faith, putting their confidence in God's truth and in a relationship with Jesus Christ, or whether they're walking by sight, seeking to please the flesh, uh, I pray that each one of us will be found walking by faith. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to open your word this morning.